Hello, everybody, and welcome to another YouTube exclusive video. Now, a couple of months ago, I did a couple of videos where I uh, solved exercises on chess.com of various difficulty levels. I did a beginner one, I did a master one, and those videos were really popular. People were asking for more, uh, and so I've listened, and so I want to make another video where I, I solve, you know, right about five to ten uh, intermediate level chess exercises. And uh, as in the previous videos, I'll talk uh, in a lot of detail through my solution and through my process of thinking and, and hopefully give you as many insights as possible that can be applied when you're solving exercises. And ultimately, why do you even solve exercises so that you can find these tactics over the board? Uh, so without further ado, let's let's jump in. Okay. So we have here our first exercise with black to play, and I've set the, the rating range on chess.com to be 1,800 to 2,200, so right about intermediate puzzles. All right, so what's going on here? Well, first thing that I see, okay, so it seems like material is, now black is down a pawn, because white has sort of a four on three going here, but that's not very significant. Um, and white's just played g4, which attacks the bishop. So anytime a pawn is pushed, I think a lot of people forget that uh, chess.com exercises give you the previous move, and that can act as a pretty big hint, right? So anytime a pawn is pushed, there's going to be other pawns, there's going to be squares that are weakened, and so the first thing that I see is this f3 pawn, which uh, which has been left alone. And and so it's worth asking uh, what happens if we take that pawn with the knight. Well, we take that pawn with the knight, we attack white's queen. And if white's queen moves, then everything is easy. Knight takes f3, let's say queen f2. Well, we can just take that uh, knight with our bishop and simultaneously defend the knight that's going to land on f3. But if we look carefully after knight takes f3, white also has the move g takes f5, and that's quite a bit more testing because uh, white counterattacks black's queen. And that leads to a situation where both of the queens are hanging. And I talk about the situation a lot in my lessons Whenever both queens are hanging, the first thing that you should look for is whether you can move your queen away with check, uh, and that should be perfectly logical, assuming your opponent has to defend against the check and is not able to cover that check with his own queen and evade the attack, then you're going to be able to take his queen on the next move. So let's look for any such checks. Knight takes f3, gf. Well, we can't check on g5 because white's knight controls that score, but we can step aside to h6. And what's very important about that is that white cannot block with the queen. I mean, he can, but both e3 and d2 are protected by black's queen and knight, respectively. So I think we can go ahead and take. And the crucial move here is queen h6 check. And if you don't see a check, the second thing you should look for is a desperado sacrifice. And I've talked about that in, in previous videos as well, where you essentially give up your queen for as much material as you can uh, and, and then take your opponent's queen. Simple enough. All right. So what's happening? What's happening here? Um, okay. Well, first thing that I see is that both kings are on the back rank, and both sides have a huge back rank weakness. White is threatening checkmate in one, and if we give a check on a one, white's going to cover with the knight. So this isn't just a mate in one problem. The other thing that I see is that our knight is hanging, so there's quite a bit going on, even though there's not a lot of pieces on the board. Um, so how would I even approach this position? Well, you know, I would start by just uh, surveying and kind of understanding uh, potential tactical ideas that you could apply, and then putting together a sequence that will involve defending against the back rank mate, and then perhaps exploiting our... Uh, ability to deliver a back rank check. So one thing that I notice here is that in a, some positions you can give knight take 92 check. I mean, obviously not here because white just takes that. But if white's queen is warded away from g4, this check could be quite scary because it could potentially send the king back to h1. And if you if you think about that, then queen a1 is going to be made because white can't really cover with the knight. Now, let's understand the order of operations. Preferably, we want to give this check when white already has a knight on f1, right? Because then uh, the king will not be able to move to f1. So it seems to make sense to start with queen a1 check. That forces knight f1. Now, what we need to do is simultaneously defend against the back rank mate 
and get the queen off of g4. Notice that our knight is defended after queen a1, so we don't have to worry about that. Now, do I see a way to do that? Okay, well, h5 comes to mind, but then the queen can just take on h5, and it's still defending e2. What about f5? That seems like a better move. f5 forces queen h5, so this is queen a1 check, knight f1, f5. The queen has to keep contact with the square. Queen h5 is forced. And then if you think along the same line, you'll see the move g6. And I just don't see any more squares on that diagonal where the queen can defend e2. I think we can go for that line check. And now, very important move, f5. Okay, queen takes d4 is easy. But the point is that if queen h5, we go g6. And the queen can no longer uh, defend the e2 square, which basically leads to checkmate. All right, next problem. Ooh, this is an interesting one. So we're down a queen for a rook and a piece, and I guess also a pawn, but you should immediately notice that bishop on h6, which is uh, ideally placed, and clearly black once again has a back rank weakness. And when I, when I say back rank weakness, I don't necessarily mean that black has pawns on f7, g7, and h7. This is also, this also qualifies as a back rank weakness, because white's controlling the g7 square. So if we got a rook to d8 or e8, it would be mate. Now, immediately the move rook e1 comes to mind. What happens there? Well, if we go rook e1, um, I think black can... Whoops, no, not rook c7. Black can drop the rook back to c8. Um, so it's not... For, or black can also go f5 and, and create some luft for the king. So we it seems we have to play in a more forcing manner. So the question is, can we somehow attack black's pieces... And, you know, one situation we could try to aim for is one where we skewer the queen. And if the queen moves, then we have uh, a back rank mate. Now, can we orchestrate that? Well, to do that, we'll need to get rid of the rook. So the move rook c1 comes to mind. So what happens after rook c1? Okay, so the bishop guards the rook. So black can't take the rook. Black has to move the queen to one of these squares. Then we trade on c3. We get the queen to c3. And then we can bring the other rook to c1. And I don't see a way in that position that black can move his queen and simultaneously guard the c8 square because h3 is protected by our pawn. Now, which rook should we put on c1? Well, that's important. I feel like if we put this rook on c1, the f rook, what black can do is go queen f5 and keep contact with the other rook. So if we take on c3 there, black takes on b1 and then returns to f5 and he's going to be guarding the c8 square at the end. So it has to be rook bc1. And attention to detail is very important when you're solving. Uh, you know, just trying to ask yourself questions. And if you ask yourself the question in the right way, you'll always be able to answer, right? Okay, which rook do I put on c1? Well, there is going to be a difference. You know that because there's only one solution. Um, and, and it's good to be able to, to detect those differences. Takes, rook c1, check, checkmate. Easy enough. Once we spot the idea. So this is the pivotal position. The black queen cannot move anywhere uh, to guard the c8 square. Moving on. Ooh, well, this one's easy. If if you've solved, you know, a good amount of, you know, beginner level puzzles on mating patterns, then you should see this one pretty quickly. Uh, this kind of general construction is really asking for an Arabian mate. And an Arabian mate is one where the knight and the rook combine to checkmate the black king in the corner. So an Arabian mate construction would happen after knight f6 and rook h7 or knight f6 and rook g8. A lot of people here would just instantly play knight f6. Unfortunately, that move's not a check. and You always have to pay attention to the status of your own king, even in an endgame. And if you do that, you'll see that white's king is essentially out of squares. And black is threatening checkmate in one. Rook c1 is just mate. So if we want to deliver an Arabian mate, we have to do it by force. So the idea that comes to mind is can we can we uh, deflect Black's king onto one of these two squares and then bring the knight to f6 with check? We'll need to sacrifice a rook to do that. Which rook do we sacrifice? Well, if we sack this rook, then the king takes. And then if we go knight f6, unfortunately, we drop the other rook. If this rook was on b7, that would be valid. What about the other way? Rook h7 check. Okay, there the king takes on h7. Then we go knight f6 check, and that works out. The king has to drop back, and then we deliver the Arabian mates. Check, check, checkmate. Oh, all right. So we have another endgame where 
white has Irish white has triple pawns on the F file. I call them Irish pawns for reasons I will eventually reveal. And technically, I guess white is up two pawns. Uh, they're not the greatest pawns. Uh, what else do I see? Well, I see the X-ray uh, that the bishop is exerting on white's king, which means there's a potential discovery with the knight. The other thing that I see here is a standoff between the two rooks. And anytime there's a standoff combined with the discovered check, uh, you have to think in the direction of using the discovery to slice off uh, the connection between one of your opponent's pieces and the piece that's involved in the standoff. So here, the bishop on e4 is guarding the rook. Now, the longer the distance physically between two pieces that are guarding each other, such as the queen and the rook or the bishop and the rook, the greater... Uh, the likelihood that something is going to occur on the squares between those two pieces, right? So if white's bishop is on c2, that's a far safer construction than a situation where white's bishop is on e4. That's not necessarily uh, something people think of intuitively. So can we use the discovery uh, to cover one of these two squares? Well, we absolutely can. We can play knight d3 check. Um, we can play knight d3 check. And then once the king steps aside... Uh, we take the rook on b1, and we're up in exchange, but that's not the end of the story, because if you keep following that line, white's going to take our knight on d3, and remember, white has two pawns for the exchange, so we need to keep calculating there. Now, if you look carefully, both of the bishops in that ensuing position, so once again, that's check, here, takes, takes. Both of the bishops are undefended, which, if you've done a good amount of chess.com puzzles, you know that they often end in a rook forking two bishops and so if you think in that direction then i see the move rook b3 hitting the bishop and if the bishop captures the pawn we capture on c3 and both of white's bishops in the end are hanging and the scary thing about forking two bishops is that they cannot defend each other because they're on different colored squares but that rook b3 move in the end is very important so check takes you can't stop here because white's attacking the rook and white's attacking c5 uh, and white technically has enough material for the exchange. So this is a very important move. Notice that the bishop is trapped. I mean, if the bishop drops back to c1, we take on c3 with the exact same effect. Okay, bishop b5, we take, and we just start mopping up uh, the rest of the pieces. Very good. Let's continue. Oh, this one's very nice, actually. Uh, so another end game, we've got a lot of stuff going on here. We have a pass pawn that's very far advanced, but it's currently being restrained by the bishop. Um, and I think the mistake a lot of people would make here is they would immediately start thinking about promoting the pawn. Can I promote the pawn? And then you'd be thinking, well, can I get white's bishop off of c3? But you don't have the enough pieces to do that. Just because you only have two or three pieces left doesn't mean you have to stop thinking about checkmate. You, you should never stop thinking about checkmate. You should always hunt for mating patterns especially when uh especially when you've got incredibly active pieces and when your opponent's king is pushed back to the first rank because there's physically less real estate you know the king just has two squares okay so the first move that comes to mind is bishop b3 check that's a pretty obvious candidate move let's see where that leads okay so king e1 is forced and then i see another check sorry i see another check with this bishop we can go bishop f2 is that mate no, it's definitely not mate. The king can step back to d2. And it seems like we haven't made... Uh, it seems like we haven't made good progress there. Um, because we've... You know, it's actually quite counterproductive. So let's go back to the position after bishop b3 check, king e1. I've noticed something interesting, which is that... After bishop f2 check, if the king had to go to f1, that's an incredibly vulnerable position to be in. And the king will be on a light square, so that bishop on b3 could potentially be used as the checkmating piece. So what comes to mind after bishop b3, king e1? We need to somehow prevent the white king from getting access to the d2 square. Well, what if we push that pawn and give it away? Bishop has to take it, otherwise we promote. But wait a second, then we go bishop f2 check. Now the king has to go to f1. And what's more, we can return to c4 with our light squared bishop. And that is simply checkmate. That's a beautiful mating construction with two bishops. So boom. And I think there's a name for this when you essentially push a pawn or sacrifice a piece to cover up one of your opponent's escape squares. 
Uh, it's a pretty typical tactical motif. So boom, 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 and uh, we got it. Look at that mate, beautiful. Next position. Okay, so this is gonna be clearly one where we're just sort of trying to attack. Um, okay, material is equal. There doesn't seem to be too much going on. Our rook is currently hanging. What else can I say about this position? Well, it seems the Plax King is quite weak. We have this bishop on d4 that's x-raying the king. I'm pretty obsessed with x-rays because they're almost always going to be important. Uh, and the other thing that I noticed is just that these two pawns are incredibly powerful. If we get to push e6, that looks completely overwhelming. But if we delve a little deeper, I think I see what the problem is. Because if we move our rook just about anywhere, black's going to grab the pawn on f5 and destroy our uh, destroy our pawn phalanx, which is not something we want to allow. Uh, so, so, the, so can we put our rook anywhere to defend this pawn? Well, not really. I mean, we can go rook f4, but then the bishop is just going to take the rook and it's even worse. So the move rook h4 comes to mind. Maybe we can pin the bishop and make something happen there. Rook h4, rook takes f5. Now, I mentioned earlier the x-ray against black's king, and it's not enough to just notice stuff. You also have to figure out, well, in, in under what circumstances can that be exploited to your advantage? How does this x-ray work? Well, in order to exploit the x-ray, we'll have to push the e-pawn at some point, right? So let's consider rook h4, rook takes f5, e6. That threatens rook takes h6 check because of the pin. The pawn cannot take the rook. Unfortunately, e6 is not a check. So here, here, here is not a check. Black has plenty of time. Black can even move the king aside to g8, uh, eliminating any problems with rook takes h6. But in these situations, you always want to check what happens if you switch the move order. If you have two moves that you're trying to make, in this case, it's e6 followed by rook takes h6. Automatic question, what happens if I make the second move first? What happens if you take the bishop first? Well, if you take the bishop first, black kind of has to take. Then you push the pawn to e6. And something I said earlier is very important. Notice that the connection between the queen and the rook occupies four squares. If you put something in between, that rook on f5 is going to be left without a defender, which is exactly what happens. Rook h4, rook takes h6, and e6 severs the connection between the queen and the rook. And then we can simply pick up black's rook, and at the end, we're just up a piece. Good. Okay. Oh, this is a pretty... I've had this one before. Um, this one... So again, first thing I see is, is tremendous pressure on Black's knight. It's being pressured by two different pieces. It's pinned. And uh, whenever there's a pinned piece, pinned pieces that are not protected by pawns are in significantly greater trouble uh, because, you know, they're a lot more tenuous. So first of all, what happens? Let, let's get a sense of what's, what's going on here. If we just take on F6, well, Black's going to take back. And I'm not really seeing where that's going, right? I mean, we can trade everything on f6, and then maybe we can take the h6 pawn, but I'm not convinced, right? That doesn't threaten anything. Uh, the solution to, to a chess deck puzzle is always going to be more convincing than just like, oh, you know, you equal material and you've got a, an open-ended attack. So we'll have to involve some other factor uh, in this position. What else do I notice? Well, I've noticed the bishop on a2 x-straying the pawn on f7. Uh, but that doesn't mean just because you notice something doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be applied. The other thing that I see is the fact that the white rook has uh, the open file. And open files can be very scary in conjunction with things like pins. And just me saying that should already kind of make you see the solution. What we can do is we can play bishop takes f6. And then we can use the rook as a decoy. We can play rook e8 check. Forking the queen and the king. That forces the queen to take. And then our knight from d5 takes that bishop on f6, which is now a fork against black's queen, which is, of course, now on e8. How did I see that? Well, that's a pattern that you should notice anytime there's a knight on d5 like this, and, you know, there's a possibility of that knight jumping somewhere, uh, you know, and your opponent's queen is in the vicinity, you have to look at ways that you can use your other pieces uh, to deflect the queen onto a, a forkable square. That's just something you've got to sort of check for. So bishop takes f6. Of course not. You can't do the same thing with knight takes f6 because then you won't have a knight to fork with. Boom. And you also can't go rook e8 first. 
Because if you go rook e8 and then bishop takes f6, black is under no obligation uh, to take on f6. Black can just ignore, and, and then we're not going to have anything to show for it. So takes, takes, check, takes on f6, and then we win the queen. Okay, let's uh, do two more. Let's do up to 10 problems, uh, and then we'll we'll stop. So this is going to be clearly one where we try to checkmate white's king. It's on h3. It's almost out of squares, uh, and we're also down a rook, so I just don't see this happening any other way. Uh, we can give a perpetual here. Notice that you can play queen g4, and then after king g2, you can go back to e2 with the queen. Uh, but let's look for more. Are there any other checks in this position? Yes, there are. There's queen f1. Is that mate? No, well, it's not mate because the bishop can drop back to g2. But one thing a lot of people struggle with in the realm of visualization is it's very easy to forget that when a piece moves away from a square, a square that it was previously defending is now, of course, undefended. It sounds simple when I say it, but when you're calculating a longer line, try to make sure that you're not uh, seeing phantom pieces, that you're really, really making sure to, to notice, okay, the bishop has moved away from e4, so whatever squares it was defending there, it's no longer defending, and one of those squares is f5. We can go queen back to f5, and that's just checkmate. g4, queen takes g4, and that's easy enough. Boom, boom, boom. All right, last one. Ooh, another one where there's quite a bit going on. This is sort of a early middle game, and my eyes are just drawn to like this. Like there's a lot there. There's also a pin, by the way. That's just important to point out. But the, the pawn on b2 is guarding the knight. So the pin doesn't seem to be uh, the reason that we're going to win this game. Uh, the x-ray though, the rook x-raying the bishop, that seems to be a lot scarier for white uh, because the bishop is only guarded by the queen. And in previous videos, I've talked about type 1 and type 2 undefended pieces. Uh, I'll do a... a video in the future where I lay out all of that terminology, but basically a type 2 undefended piece is a piece that is only guarded by exactly one other piece. The bishop is only guarded by the queen. The queen is not a very good defender because it's very easy to attack. Uh, so the first thing that comes to mind to me is, well, knight takes e5, right? Let's let's try to take that knight and then maybe take the bishop, and then maybe we can we can force the queen onto f5, and then we're going to have a potential discovery, right? So knight takes e5, Okay, probably white has to take back. Then we take the bishop. Then the queen takes. And in that position, is there anywhere appealing that we can put our knight? Well, there is, right? And this is where initial observation is very important. I said this pin is not very dangerous. Well, I didn't know that yet. And the move knight e4 comes to mind in that position, hitting the queen. And when the queen moves, we can just take the knight on c3. And if white recaptures, we recapture with our bishop. And we give a fork to the king and the rook. So I think it's knight takes e5, bishop takes e4, and boom, boom. You can very clearly see how these tactics are composed of individual elements that you can detect and you can observe and you can put them together. Uh, so, you know, and, and the more you solve, you know, the better you become at identifying factors in the position that may play a role tactically. But I can't stress this enough. Just because you've made a comprehensive set of observations doesn't mean you're automatically going to see the tactic. You have to uh, fulfill that, inter you know, that intermediate step where, okay, you make observations and then you actually look at moves. Okay, how can I exploit this? How can I try to exploit that? And it's also important to realize that not everything in every position can always be exploited, uh, you know, and you shouldn't assume that it can be. So that was 10 intermediate level problems that took us about... Uh, 20, 25 minutes. I think that's a perfect place to stop. I will definitely be making more of these videos uh, in the future on uh, beginner, more beginner problems and master level problems. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, as always, feel free to leave questions in uh, the comments and I will see you very soon in the next video. Thank you.